right. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. We are live tonight. Give everybody a few minutes to join in, jump in with us. I'm excited about this study tonight. Revelation 19 and 20. In our study of uh, eschatology, uh, we're getting ready to go in about another minute or so. We're getting ready to go. So come on, join in with us on tonight. Please like, please share. We're going to get into it. This study has been so dynamic. I just thank God for it. And give everybody just another minute or so to jump in. Such an important topic. Amen. Amen. See a few people logging in. Thank you for joining in with us tonight. All right, we're getting ready to get into it. Tonight, um, as always, when, when anything we do, we want to invite the Lord's presence in. So come on, just join in with me and let's pray. Father, we bless your name and we glorify you. We thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you, God, for every blessing, God, that you have bestowed to us, God. We thank you for being good, Lord God, being faithful, being true. Right now, Lord God, we ask and pray, God, that you would move in our Bible study tonight, move in this rooted you tonight as we study your word and we've come to learn of you. I pray that you would touch our hearts, touch our mind, open up our understanding one more time. Let revelation flow, Father, into our hearts, oh God, tonight. Draw us closer to you. Thank you for the victory that we have in you and the promise that is in your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we thank you, Lord God, that all those who trust in your word will never be ashamed. Father, that we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, O oh Lord God, whose leaves do bring forth its fruit in season. Father, we thank you that your word is powerful, that your word is life unto us. Bless us tonight as we journey in, and we will give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. So thank y'all, um, everybody who's who's joined in tonight. Uh, we just appreciate you. Um, coming in and showing your hunger and thirst for the word. I mean, uh, with everything that's going on in our world, I mean, Lord, uh, this world needs Jesus, you know, to see, uh, you know, the, the, just speaking of current events, we got coronavirus going on still. Um, you have, you know, police brutality and killing of uh, innocent people, uh, innocent black lives being taken. Uh, it's just so much going on right now, and more than ever, uh, we need to be rooted uh, in God and rooted in his word and rooted in prayer and uh, find ourselves rooted in Christ. And so um, tonight, we're going to be reading 19 and 20, um, and then we're almost at the end of our study of eschatology and, uh, and end times. So we're going to get right into it. I want to prolong the time. Uh, let's go to the word tonight. Uh, Revelation 19 and 20. So I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. We've been reading out of the New Living Translation uh, for the sake of understanding. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this we're going to be looking at a picture that John begins to talk about a song of victory in heaven. All right. And we're going to literally see the return of Christ, the glorious return of Christ and what he comes to do when he returns. So let's go. All right. It says uh, the songs of victory in heaven, Revelation 19. And it says, after this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting. And it said, praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just, and he has punished the great prostitute 
who corrupted the earth with her uh, immorality. And he has avenged the murder of his servants. And again, their voices rang out, praise the Lord. And the smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. And then the 24 elders and the four living beings, they fell down and worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. They cried out, amen, praise the Lord. And from the throne came a voice that said, praise our God, all his servants, all who fear him from the least to the greatest. And then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. All right. And then the angel said unto me, uh, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. And I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. Wow. Let's stop right there. Let's stop right there so we can break that down uh, as far as what we're seeing and what we're witnessing there. All right. Um, so coming on to that, it says this. Um, we see this song, the song of victory uh, in heaven, right? And the song of victory is, is going forth and uh, the scripture lets us know, and it says that I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, uh, praise the Lord. In the King James Version, it uses the word hallelujah. It uses the word hallelujah. Now, you will find it interesting that, um, number one, uh, we often said that Revelation gives you a snapshot into what heaven is like oftentimes. And we're going to talk about heaven a lot in the next uh, next two, no, sorry, the next two chapters, particularly after we get through with Revelation 19 and 20, you're going to talk, we're going to talk about heaven a lot. But one thing that you notice is that uh, the praise of heaven is not quiet. The praise of heaven is not quiet. Uh, so for all those, you know, who, you know, they, they believe in quiet and reserved worship and that everybody ought to just sit with their hands folded and say, Oh Lord, we bless you. Oh, you know, oh God with no expression and no, no feeling and no uh, exuberance. Um, I'm just going to let you know that the worship of heaven does not look like that. Um, the worship of heaven does not sound like that. The worship of heaven, it says it is loud. It cried with a loud voice. They cried with an expression because here's the thing. I don't understand how God, how you can worship a God who is this good and not worship him with some kind of emotion, not worship him with some kind of feeling. You know, it's not just, oh, hallelujah, Lord, I bless you. It's Lord, hallelujah, I bless you. You are good. It's, it's a response to the mercies of God and the grace of God. And it says that they shouted and they shouted the words, hallelujah. Now, in the New Living Translation, it's translated praise the Lord. All right. Hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. And it's and it's and it's uh, essence is that you praise the Lord in the highest form. And that's why oftentimes you hear people say what that hallelujah is like the highest praise. Hallelujah. We, we bless him. We praise the Lord in the utmost. We praise the Lord in the highest. Now, hallelujah, the word hallelujah is actually only found uh, four times in the in the New Testament. And it's actually in this particular chapter. Uh, 
you know, hallelujah in the Old Testament is you all throughout the Psalms and all uh, throughout uh, the scripture, you see the words hallelujah. But here uh, in Revelation in the New Testament, this is the only use of hallelujah. So they cry out hallelujah. Um, uh, my sister, sister, sister Crider, she said, you know, God made us to worship him. I love that. I love that. He made us to worship him. And so if you get tired of worship here, if you grow weary of worship here, I don't know what you're going to do in heaven because that's that's one of the primary activities of heaven is to worship him and to praise him and to bless him. Uh, and we will see him for who he really is. All right. So they praise the Lord and they're praising him because he's about to bring judgment to the earth and he's about to bring judgment to the immoral immoralities of the of the earth. And he avenged the murder of his servants. Now, that speaks so true um, in light of, you know, even current events. You know, God, God sees and he knows he sees and he knows he sees injustice. He sees uh, 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 even racism at its core. He sees, you know, the evils of the world. And, and in this time, he prolongs and he suspends his judgment. But there is coming a day where men will be repaid for their works. And those who are not found in the Savior, they will be, re they will be repaid for their evil deeds and all of these things. So he says, eventually God will bring justice to not only, uh, he will bring justice not only in, in, the, in the sense of heavenly sense, but he will bring justice to every person on on earth and the things that are done in the earth. So the 24 elders and the living beings, they fall down and they begin to worship him and they begin to sing this song, praise God, uh, and, and they begin to, to, to bless him. And, and so uh, John then begins to hear, uh, he begins to hear a sound of a great crowd uh, of that sound like a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. This is because heaven, you know, this is the 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 bodies of, of believers through all ages and the angels and join together in praise to God in one sound and in one voice. Uh, the scripture gave us a description of this multitude in previous chapters. It says of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every of every kindred. You know, uh, heaven is a diverse place. Heaven doesn't have uh, just whites or blacks. Heaven doesn't have uh, just Baptist or Methodist. Heaven doesn't have, you know, uh, just one segment of people. Heaven has uh, every nation, tribe, and tongue represented. So, you know, for people, uh, you know, that this is why, this is why I honestly don't believe that, you know, you can have hatred in your heart or racism in your heart, and really you won't fit in in heaven. You won't fit in in heaven. You wouldn't feel comfortable in heaven. <laughs> Oh, God, that's good right there. Uh, and, and so uh, we praise him and we glorify him um, now, uh, now in the earth, because it is what we are going to do in heaven. So they say uh, they go on to say, praise the Lord for the Lord almighty reigns. We, they begin to rejoice. And they said that the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride. Come on, catch this. His bride has prepared herself. His bride has prepared herself. And so we understand, um, you know, when, when a man and a woman, for example, a man and a woman love each other uh, and they are espoused or they are engaged, they are living in preparation for the wedding day. They are living in preparation for the consummation of, of their love, which is symbolized by the time where they're united in the wedding feast. And so uh, when Christ when Christ then uh, marks us as his own, the Bible lets us know that we have been prepared like a bride. We have been espoused to Christ. We are engaged to him now. And there is a future coming where we will be uh, uh, when the marriage ceremony takes place and we will be made one, just like a husband and wife are made one on their wedding day. And if you know anything about uh, being engaged and being espoused, when you are engaged or espoused to somebody, you are already uh, making yourself prepared and you're in your, you better be faithful um, because, because you understand that the wedding day is coming. 
And so Jesus gave several analogies like this. He gave a parable of, um, of the wedding feast when you had uh, five wise virgins and uh, the five foolish virgins. All right. And so um, the ones that were prepared, they kept their oil. They kept the oil in their lamps and they were watching and they were waiting. And the ones who were foolish, the foolish virgins, um, they they were uh, unprepared and then they ran out of oil. And then at the time where it was time for the marriage celebration, they were not ready. Oh, God, will you be ready? Will you be ready for his appearing? Are you living in such a way to know that this glorious day is coming where we one day will be united to, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ? All right. So I want to touch on that a little bit. Um, in the scripture, uh, let's see, touch on that a little bit in the scripture and where it says, uh, the marriage of the lamb has come and, and, and we understand that all of history has been waiting for this day. They, all of history has been waiting for this time where Christ will return and, um, and rule and reign on the earth. So, uh, the scripture lets us know in, for example, 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians um, 11 and 2. We understand uh, that Paul says, listen to these words, 2 Corinthians uh, 11 and 2. Paul says, I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promise you as a pure bride. I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. That's second Corinthians 11 and two. So we have been, you know, Paul says, I am, I am literally grooming you because you are engaged or you are promised to be a pure bride. The word of God says that he's coming back for a church without what, without spot or without wrinkle, without spot or wrinkle. And that's not talking about, that's not saying that you are, are uh, perfect, but you are living in a way, you are living in such a way that every single day, I live to give God my all. Every single day, I live to see that he is glorified. Every single day, I'm examining my life. Every single day, I'm striving after holiness. Every single day, I want to be more Christ-like. I want to be more Christ-like in my thoughts. I want to be more Christ-like. Uh, I want to be more Christ-like in my attitude. I want to be more Christ-like in my actions. I want to put away old habits. I want to put away uh, old sinful things that used to have me bound. I, I want to be more like him. Why? Because how does a bride, a bride on her wedding day, she wants everything to be perfect. That's why she makes sure that her, her hair is flawless. She makes sure that the gown that she that she puts on is flawless. She makes sure that her makeup is flawless. You will never, you know, men, you can probably relate to this. You probably will never see your wife as beautiful as you saw her on the wedding day. Um, because she has literally uh, prepared herself uh, in, in a way that because this day is special. And, and, and the thing about it is that we have to understand that as Christians, we have to understand that we are preparing ourselves so that when he comes, he will find us as that beautiful bride. He will come and he will be pleased with what he sees. But what if the Lord was to come at an hour that you're not ready? Oh my God, I know this is heavy tonight, but what if he was to come in an hour where you're not ready? You're undone. You're undone. You're, you are, you are uh, uh, undone. Your hair is undone. You're, you're not in your garments. You are, you are not prepared. That's what it looks like when he, if he was to find us uh, in, in such a way, not living uh, in a way that shows him that, Lord, we are ready for your coming. We, we understand that we are married to you. Um, that we are, we belong to one husband and that is Christ. My God. So another scripture says Ephesians, um, Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. It says this, as the scriptures say, a man will leave his father and his mother and is joined to his wife. And these two are united into one. And Paul goes on to say, this is a great mystery but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So just as, just as a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and God makes them one in the spirit, one flesh, we are to leave, we are to leave the world. We are to leave 
uh, the, the, the nature of sin. We are to leave the old life behind and we are to be united and joined to one and that is Christ. So church, make yourself ready because the groom is coming. My God, church, make yourself ready because he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And I feel bad for those who are, who are in church, but they're not living the life. I feel bad for those who are, who are, who are playing with this thing and not living this thing for real, who think that they got all this time and think that they got all this, all this time to repent and all this time. And I'm just going to enjoy my sinful life. And I'm just going to enjoy my sinful activities. And, and, you know, because, because I can't, you know, I really don't know, you know, when he's coming, but my God, you got to understand that he he's coming and he says, my reward is with me. Glory to God. All right, let's go. Let's go on. Let's go on from here. Uh, so we are being prepared uh, for this day where we will be married and joined unto him. And so uh, John, uh, at, with everything that he was seeing, with everything that he was that he was showing, that he was shown, John becomes so overwhelmed that he that he um, falls down at the feet of the angel uh, to worship. He falls down at the feet of the angel to worship, but the angel is like, listen. Don't worship me. Do not worship me. You got to understand that uh, everything that, that I am just a servant like you and everything that I do is to reflect and point the glory to God. Everything that I do is to reflect and point the glory to God. And so it is it is uh, something to note that angels never you never see angels receiving worship in the Bible. You never see angels receiving worship in the Bible. Uh, whenever, whenever there was a time where men tried to worship angels, uh, what they would do is they would deflect the glory back unto God. He says, cause we are fellow servants. So what does that say for us? Whatever we do in this life and people want to point credit or glory to you, you ought to always deflect the glory back to God. When people tell you how wonderful you are, it's okay to say, oh, thank you. When people say, oh my God, you prophesied. Oh my God, you preach. Oh my God, you sang. Oh my God, you play so well. Oh my God, you serve so well. Don't ever get caught up in receiving uh, the glory for yourself. Don't ever get caught up in receiving the credit for yourself because you got to realize that we don't do anything without God. Anytime you steal the glory from God, you, you adopt, the, you adopt uh, the same spirit that Satan had, Lucifer. He said, he said, I will ascend unto the hill of the most high. And he said, I will ascend into the hill of the Lord and I will be like the most high. It's a bad, God says, I will share my glory with, with none other. What's up, Kyrie, man? Good to see you, brother. <laughs> I will share my glory with none other. And so anytime we do anything for God, we point the glory back to him, point the glory back to him. Uh, humility is, is something that is, oh God, you see less and less. Sometimes it's bad sometimes amongst leaders that is so hard to find leaders who are truly submitted and humble. Uh, uh, not that I come to sit in the high seat, not that I come with my fancy robe on and not that I come with a fancy title and name. You know, I was just talking with some friends yesterday and like like something that bothers me. I cannot stand to see a, a preacher, a, a prophet, a teacher or whatever, who when it's time to worship, that they sit in their little, you know, high seat and just look around and, you know, don't engage in the worship. You know, that bothers me, you know, and the people say, oh, maybe they're meditating. Maybe they're thinking I get it. I get it. But when I come into the house of the Lord, um, I, I can't help but to worship him. All right. I can't help but to give him the glory, you know. And, and sometimes we paint a picture as if, you know, when we get into leadership that y'all need the worship and I don't. <laughs> we paint the picture that like y'all need the word and I, and I don't. All right. Um, but, you know, the, like priests, like people. When you see me, you're going to see me with my hands raised. When you see me, you're going to see me laying on the floor with my face to the ground, giving God the glory. Uh, we got to always point the glory back to God. All right. And so and so um, and so uh, what we got to understand is that uh, it's, it's one thing uh, whenever the angel received worship, but he pointed it back to God. Now, we, when you look at the scripture, uh, Hebrews uh, one and six, Jesus was worshiped. Matthew eight and two, Jesus was worshiped. 
Matthew 14 and 33, Jesus was worshiped. And also John 9 and 38, Jesus was worshiped. And so Jesus received worship and let him know that his name was higher than the name of the angels. His name was higher than the name of angels, but angels never received worship. They pointed the glory back to God. All right, let's move forward. Let's fast forward because we got a long way to cover in a short amount of time. All right. All right. So uh, the next thing uh, we find out that Jesus now is coming back in his return. All right. And in doing so, uh, we're going to read the rest of the, of the passage here. So let's go back to the word. And he says, uh, the angel says, and the angel said uh, to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb. They, these are the true words that come from God. All right. So now let's go to verse 11. All right. Let's go to verse 11 and we're going to continue reading. All right. And it says, then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Here goes. A white horse was standing there and its rider was named faithful and true for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war and his eyes were like flames of fire and on his head were like many crowns and a name was written on him that no one understood except himself and he wore a robe dipped in blood and his title was the word of God. And the armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron rod. And he will release the fierce wrath of God, the almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written, uh, this title, King of King, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, come gather for the great banquet of God is, has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings and generals and strong warriors and horses and their riders and all of humanity, both free and slave, small and great. And then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured. Watch this. And with him, the false prophet who did many mighty miracles on behalf of the beast and, uh, and the miracles that deceived all those who had accepted the mark of the beast and worshiped his statue and both the beast and his false prophet was thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. And the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. Wow. Okay. Pause. Let's rewind. And let's, let's talk about this. So now you see... Now we're coming to the, the culmination of the of the events. Revelation has gone forward and and now we're talking about uh, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Right. Thank you, Lady K. I see that uh, the king of kings and Lord of lords. And he's coming back. And John sees the return of the one who, who, who promised that when he came back that he was going to reign, right? And so he's riding on a white horse. He's riding on a white horse. And it says his name is faithful and true. So we're given a description of him. His eyes are like flaming fire, all right? He's riding on a white horse. He's dipped in a robe that is dipped in, the, in, uh, dipped in blood, all right? And the armies of heaven follow him. So let me paint the picture, right? So the first time he came, the first time he came, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem the first time, he was riding on a donkey, all right? Oh, my God. He was riding on a donkey when the first time he came. Now, a donkey was a common animal. A donkey was not an animal that was, that was established with great prestige or with great might or with great valor. He chose the humble route. He chose to be a servant even unto the death of the cross. And he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem, although he was king of kings and lord of lords. And so he rode on a donkey during his first coming. 
In his first coming, he wore a, a, a robe and the soldiers stripped his robe and they, they gambled and they cast lots to see who would take his robe. But this time he comes back with a robe that is dipped in his own blood, signifying that he has paid the price for all sin, for all for all uh, 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 injustice. He has paid the price for all of humanity. Right. The last time we saw him, he was crowned with a crown of thorns on his head. But this time when we see him, he is wearing many crowns of gold that sim symbolize he is the reigning king with all authority in his hand. Y'all. Y'all better see this on tonight. Um, uh, and, and we understand that that not only that, that the first time he came, um, now you see him riding on a white horse, right? He rode on a donkey, but now he's riding on a white horse. And a white horse was a symbol of authority and power. The, the Jesus that you saw in the first coming is not the same Jesus that you see in the second coming, because this time he's coming with an agenda to rule and to reign. And he's coming to deal with the enemies of God. And he's coming to judge the nations, the Bible says, with an iron fist. Oh, don't play with him, y'all. Don't play with him. Because he's not anybody to play with. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant, Philippians chapter 2. But when he comes back, he's coming back with all authority and all power in his hands. It says that his eyes are like flames of fire. Understand that his eyes are given the nature to see uh, and discern even down to the, 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 the intents and the hearts of men. Uh, uh, he, he, he was known as the, as the lamb of God, but he's coming back as the lion of Judah. Woo, God, I feel you in here tonight. He's coming back as the lion of Judah, my God. And, and so it says that the, there's a mighty sword that comes out of his mouth. I, I see that. Thank you. Uh, Minister Chavis says pure authority and power. Yes, pure authority and power. You better understand that when he comes back this time, he's coming back with, uh, with a sword in his mouth. And so, and so this is the scene. This is the scene. Y'all remember the battle of Armageddon. We read that in the last chapter. The battle of Armageddon is taking place. And the nations, the nations have been, uh, uh, they have been aroused by a spirit of deception. The spirits that come out of that bottomless pit. And they, are, they, they come and they seduce an army. Uh, and they begin to come to siege over Israel. They're coming literally to swipe out and to siege Israel. And right before they, they destroy um, the remnant, the 144,000, right before they destroy Jerusalem, Christ comes and he, he comes with the sound uh, uh, of, the, of the, the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel. And he cracks the sky and he begins to make his descent. And he comes down with all authority in his, in his, in his hands. And he begins to destroy the armies of the Antichrist. And he destroys them with the presence of his glory and with the fire out of his mouth. And he begins, he seizes, he seizes the, the Antichrist, the beast and the false prophet, and he casts them into the lake of fire. Oh, yes, our God reigns. Our God wins in the end. And he says he's coming with the armies of heaven. He's coming with the armies of heaven. So who consists of the armies of heaven? Christ says that when I come back, all those who have died, all those who have died in Christ, who have died from eternity, from eternity past to eternity in the future, uh, all those who have died with him, he says he's coming back with them. He comes back with them, the armies of heaven, the angels and the saints of, of, of times past. And the scripture lets us know, going back to First Thessalonians, that anyone who is alive and remains in the earth at this time, they will be caught up with him to meet him in the air, all right? And so that when they're caught up with him, that they will not be excluded from his triumphal entry into the earth. They will not be excluded. So they're caught up uh, into the air and then, and then Christ is making his descent, destroys the armies of the Antichrist and the beast and then makes his descent down into the Mount of Olives, uh, which is in the, in the city of Jerusalem. This is all prophesied, y'all, the, the powerful reign of Christ's return. So Jesus, Jesus' return is um, prophesied uh, in Zechariah, Zechariah 14, 3 and 4, uh, many different scriptures. What a sight it will be, right? What a sight it will be. Uh, and every eye will see him. 
every eye will see him. Every This is the time where it says, and uh, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. My God, my God. So he seizes, uh, he seizes the beast and they are cast into the lake of fire um, where they are killed. And they, the entire army is killed with the sword that, that received the mark of the beast and that were uh, coming against uh, God's people, Israel. So God, once again, he's not through with Israel. This is when the scripture says that they will then, Israel will then look upon the one whom they have pierced. And Christ will reveal himself to the remnant of Israel. And he will say, I know you didn't know it. I know you didn't understand it, but I was your Messiah. I was the one that the scriptures prophesied about. And although you rejected me, I have reserved to myself a remnant so that I would fulfill my word, even back to my servant, Abraham, that I would make you a nation, that I would make you a people and I would never forsake the covenant with your people. My God. And so he restores uh, his messiahship to the people of Israel. And so here we are. He comes with the brightness of his coming, a sword in his mouth eyes flame of fire, destroys the armies of Armageddon as the nations of the world witness, all right? And, and he, he comes down and uh, we, are, we are with him, whether we are alive and remain or whether we have, been, uh, we have died and are with him, we all come with him. And, and here is the part. Now we go into chapter 20. Here is one of the least known, least studied uh, passages of scripture that you will find is Revelation chapter 20. Lord, help me tonight. Let's go there. Let's go there. Are y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? All right. Share this. Share this. Share this. All right. Share this live. Somebody needs to hear this word. So we're going to Revelation chapter 20. Grab your word because you don't want to miss this. All right. Here we go. And it says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. And the angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which then he shut and locked. So Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. And afterwards, he must be released for a little while. All right. I'm telling you, this is one of the least studied passages of scripture uh, in all of the Bible. And then he says, then I saw thrones and the people sitting on them that had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. For they had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor had accepted the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they all came to life again and they reigned with Christ. Watch this. They reigned with Christ for 1,000 years. John goes on to say, this is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and Christ will reign with him for reign with him for a thousand years. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. All right. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. OK, wow. Is this not like uh, uh, revelating? OK. So Christ comes back. Here he goes. Here's the scene. The battle of Armageddon. The, the, the nations over the world are coming to come against Israel. Christ cracks the sky. He, he cracks the sky. The voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet. And so the, he's coming with the angels and the armies of heaven. Those who are alive and remain, they are caught up, snatched up in a twinkling of an eye. In a moment, they are caught up with the Lord in the air. Christ then destroys the armies. He destroys the armies. Of, of the beast and the false prophet. Then he descends down to the earth 
and he comes down at the center of, of, of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, right? Prevented from deceiving people. Satan and all of his de demonic al alliance is bound during this time, all right? So it is, it is during this reign of Christ that people will see and know Christ for who he is, and he will reign over the nations, and war will not be tolerated, all right? What's the next thing? Uh, the next thing during the millennium. Uh, during the millennium, it says... Um, that 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 the earth will be transformed. Uh, some of the places of the earth that have been destroyed and that have been worn down and and, uh, and destroyed by humans, um, that the earth will be restored. And even uh, there's a scripture said that that the animals will become the animals will become tame like pets. It, there's one scripture that says a child will lead will lead the leopard and the lion and the bear. A child will be able to play with a leopard and a lion and a bear. And it says that uh, even the poisonous dangers like cobras and vipers will be gone, right? And so uh, that's another scripture found in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 11, six through nine, where he reverses the curse that was on the earth. So earth is restored back to like its Edenic state. Remember in Eden, where animals were tamed, and where where the earth was beautified was was beautified again, and God will restore the earth, and and He will eliminate um, uh, the 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 ugliness that sin brought into the world, and this is all this is all before heaven, y'all. Heaven ain't even get even get here yet, <laughs> the thousand year reign of Christ. Okay, and so uh, another thing, this is just side note. If you really study it, David will be. Uh, David will be given uh, a special position as the prince of God. He will be God's prince. I found that interesting. That's found in Isaiah 55, 3 through 5, uh, Jeremiah 34 through 11, Ezekiel 34, 23 through 31, um, and Hosea 3 and 5, where David will be a prince of God. Now, why, why did he choose David, right? Why did he choose David in the millennial kingdom to be recognized as a prince of God, right? Uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the king, but David is given the, the, the position as prince, all right? And that is because David is said in the scripture to be a man after God's own heart. He is said to be a man after God's own heart. There was something about the life of David and the worship of David and the heart of David, how he loved God, how he longed for God, that God made a covenant with him and said, I will always allow one of your descendants to reign on the throne. And in the and in the millennial kingdom, you will be a prince of God. Wow. That is amazing. Uh, what else? During the millennium, there will be uh, there will be a rebuilt temple. And Jesus will be worshipped from the rebuilt temple. All right. So all of these things uh, in the millennium, the saints will be resurrected and given. That's where they will get their rewards, the rewards for what they have done in this life. It's in the kingdom reign. All right. So the millennium is where God brings his justice. It's where God shows that his reign over the earth, uh, that he will, that he inherits the kingdoms of the world and the kingdoms of the earth. So let's finish this out. Because as unbelievable as it sounds, Satan has not been dealt with for the final time. He has not been dealt with for the final time. Isn't that, isn't that something? So let's finish this out as we read tonight. We're going back to Revelation 20, verse number seven. All right. And it says, when the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations, Gog and Magog, in every corner of the earth. And he will gather them together for battle. A mighty army, as numberless as the sands along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on, on a broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the armies and consumed them. And then the devil 
who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever. All right. So if this if this is shocking you, if, if it's, I, I, I understand, because, again, we don't study this a whole lot. But you got to understand this is that so uh, after the thousand year reign of Christ, Satan and the demonic spirits are released for that. That period of judgment is over. They are released and immediately they go back to their job of deceiving people. Immediately they go back to their job of coming against God. All right. So, again, they can't affect those of us who have already been resurrected and glorified but they are the nations of those who are not uh who have not been redeemed and they go out and they immediately deceive them and just like that people that were under subjection of christ in the presence of satan uh in the presence of these demonic influence they again revolt because sometimes people are subject not because they are willfully worshiping but because they had no other options and as soon as Satan comes on the scene, he deceives them and they, they, they again rally again an, an army to come to try to come against Jehovah, try to come against Jesus Christ. And this time the, the Lord says that this is the final judgment and fire comes down from heaven and he, he destroys the rebellion once and for all. All right. And now Satan now meets his judgment and he is now cast into the lake of fire where he joins the, the beast and the false prophet. So God deals with all evil and he deals with all sin one last time, all right? So let's finish the scripture out. Let's finish the scripture out. The final judgment, and then we're done for tonight. It says the final judgment, Revelation 20, verse number 11. And he says, and then I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it, and the earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up its dead and death and the grave gave up their dead and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. And this lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose names was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. All right. So here, so here goes the final, the final judgment. Now you remember the first resurrection, the first resurrection took place at Christ's return when he comes to judge uh, the, the nations. And then you have Satan is bound for a thousand years. You have, you have the 1000 year or the millennial reign of Christ. And then Satan is loose for a season. And then the final judgment comes. He deals with Satan once and for all. Satan will never, ever again be a problem. He will never, ever again be uh, able to deceive, be able to, uh, to harm. He will never, ever, ever be able to come against God the final time. And then the dead are resurrected. Now the dead are resurrected. But this resurrection is is for the wicked dead. This resurrection are for those who will be judged. This resurrection are for those who are whose temporary place is in a place called Hades, which is the holding place of the dead. All right, it's where they are held uh, in the place of the dead, Hades, until the final judgment, and they will have to stand before God. This is known as the great white throne judgment of God, the great white throne judgment. And this is where the books are open and where everything in your life is now evaluated and you are given uh, your reward 
for the things that you did. My God, you don't want to you don't want to stand before God in that final judgment. You don't want to stand before God. That's why he said, blessed are those who are partakers of the first revelation because the second, the, sorry, the first resurrection, because the second resurrection is not one of reward. The second resurrection is those that got to stand before God and now be judged. The second, the second uh, resurrection is those who have to now give account for the things that they did in this life. It says death and hell give up the dead, the sea give up the dead, and they are judged according to what is written in the books. And so the Bible lets us know that the angels record, that heaven is recording the things that we did, the things that we said, even the opportunities that we had, that, that God is a perfectly just God. And so blessed are those who partake in the first resurrection. Now, all of this happens. Watch this. All of this happens before we enter in to what we know as heaven. All of this takes place before we enter into what we know as heaven. So oftentimes we have never really learned about this millennial reign of Christ and how he's coming to the earth to reign for the thousand year period, how we will reign with him. We receive our reward in the millennial kingdom. We receive our authority in the millennial kingdom. Uh, we reign with God. And for this thousand year period and heaven, the, what we think of, quote unquote, living in heaven and eternity comes after this. All right. That's where you see the streets are paved with gold. And and you talk about the, the beauty and the splendor, because God is like after the thousand year reign, I got another surprise for you. <laughs> I got another surprise for you. And that's where evil is eradicated for the final and last time. And you will see that God has prepared the most beautiful paradise, more beautiful than the earth, the most beautiful paradise for his children to live in forever. Heaven is coming after the millennial reign, my God. And if you thought the reign of Christ was awesome, wait till you see heaven. So that's where we're going in the next chapters uh, the next two chapters. And guess what, y'all? Next week, we will be finished with Revelation because we're going to read Revelation 21 and we're going to read Revelation 22. And we are going to study what is heaven like and what is the nature of heaven. Y'all, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really, it's going to really, really open your eyes um, so much to what our destiny is in God. Lady K says, thank you so much for, thank you for solid teaching, Pastor. Uh, may God bless you abundantly. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate y'all tuning in tonight. And like I said, it's stuff that we don't often hear, but this is the destiny of the, of the saints. This is where we're headed. I mean, when, when you have faith, this is what we, when you have faith, this is what we bank our, the entirety of our life on, is that I put my life on this. I trust this with my life. I'm not living this life the way that I do uh, uh, if I didn't believe that this was true. Paul said, if we only had the reward in this life, he said, what a miserable salvation that would be. We might as well drink. We might as well go out and party. We might as well enjoy ourselves because once this life is over, that's it. We might as well live it up here. If our salvation and our reward was only based on this life. And listen, God is good even in this life. Yes, he is. He's good even in this life. He shows favor. He shows blessings. He gives us peace. He gives us healing. He gives us joy. He shows us the essence of what true love is. He teaches us how to treat our neighbors. Oh yeah, God is good in this life. But God, the 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 level of how God is going to bless us in the in the millennial reign and in the heaven that is to come, it does not compare, y'all. It does not compare to any pleasure, to any blessing, to any gift that you can get in this life. So I bank and I put my whole the entirety of, of everything in this confidence and in this faith. I live the way I do because of this faith. I live in the perspective that I do because of this destiny. Why would, you know, you think about even like the call of a pastor, the call of a pastor, the call of a leader. Why would I, you know, uh, uh, forsake 
everything that I could be doing and 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 uh, just sacrifice my time and my energy and my life to to serve God and to serve his people it's because I believe what this word says so your faith and your worldview it should change the way that you live we got an eternal perspective I mean if that was the case if it was only in this life you know deuces y'all I'm going on vacation like y'all I'm going to relax I'm not you know uh, you know exercising all this time my time pouring in pouring into people preaching this word living a life before people is because not only is this you know not only is the reward in this life but this is a call it's a call into a destiny y'all and and believers in Christ you have a destiny that God has already solidified it's already done somebody put that in the comments it's already done it's already done. It's not a question mark in God's mind. He already spelled it out what he's going to do. So I'm, we're going to let you go for tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this teaching. Like I said, it's 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 not taught that often, um, but we understand and we know that it's already done. It's already done. And uh, we shall reign with him. If you suffer with him, you're going to reign with him. What you go through in this life now, he's going to make sure that he rewards you with the reign in, in his kingdom. All right, he's not stingy. He's not stingy. He's like, I, I'm going to show the world that, that you were with me. I'm going to show the world that you were part of me because you're going to have part in my reign. All right, saints of God, be encouraged. Uh, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is Jesus says this. He says, he says, do not be troubled because I have already overcome the world. All right. And there is a lot of things that can make you anxious. There's a lot of things that can make you depressed, angry, resentful, bitter. There's a lot of things that go on, injustices and all kinds of things that we go through in life, sickness. And uh, uh, we suffer, you know, uh, things that, that just come that we have no control over. But he says, you know, understand that I have already overcome the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Be encouraged tonight. Uh, know that God is on your side. And because he's on your side, you've got a great destiny in him. And that destiny will be realized and it will come to pass just as sure as God said it. All right. I love you guys. God bless. Until next time. Y'all be blessed.